Hello, everyone. Welcome to Joycast number five with Miss Nora Taylor. Um, thank you, Nora, for being here with us today. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yay! Of course, of course. All right, before we get uh, started and talking about the Joycast and all things Nora Taylor, I just want to tell you what Camp Joy is for any of our new friends logging on today. So Camp Joy is a company that Catherine and I started during the pandemic because we wanted to find ways for people to continue to build community and meet new people and just like have some fun over the internet. Nora was actually one of our first campers in our Monday through Friday week long camp. She logged on for 30 minutes a day and did ridiculous things like sandwich making contests and letter writing. And it was such a blast, but um, so yeah. You, what, was your, what was your favorite moment during Camp Joy? I just loved all of the water and dancing breaks. <laughs> like, I mean, I, the activities were great, but just to sort of just break out of your rut and be like, yeah, let's dance with some Madonna and drink water and everyone looks completely silly. It was just yeah. very, it was a, like a nice break to the day for sure. Yeah. Hydration station was a highlight for all, I think. I know we haven't done a hydration station in a long time. <laughs> let's I do it right now. Let's <laughs> go water. Amazing work, everybody. Yeah. Wow. Wow, everybody. Getting hydrated at five o'clock. Kids. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I was I was waiting. I was like, is there more you want to ask uh, Nora? Um, so the, I, would attack. I just love these two people so much. We're having such a good time already. Um, okay. So the reason I'm going to say a little bit about why we do joy cast essentially on this journey of seeking joy. Um, we have found that every single camper and every single person we've encountered through working on camp joy has their own unique relationship to joy. It's really, really personal and unique. And so joy cast is a way of, for us to get to learn more about how people find joy to educate ourselves on joy. Um, and also to invite a lot of different perspectives about the ways that others, those folks who are listening, the folks who will eventually see this on YouTube, how can you go about finding some joy in your day? Um, maybe there's an avenue you haven't tried yet. Um, so if you are watching, please, um, I have the comments pulled up. So we will be answering questions at the end. So, um, you know, please, please, please uh, take part in our conversation. Yeah, and yeah. The, reason we, the reason we wanted to chat with Nora today is because uh, we wanted to talk about joy in space, joy in the things around us. Nora is one of the first people in my life who taught me about apartment therapy and like understanding how it works, how we feel in a space, different objects that we own, what to keep, what to get rid of. And so um, Nora is currently the editor at Clever, which is the digital platform of Architectural Digest. They're their slogan is design, uh, design advice for everyday life. And uh, previous to that, she worked at apartment therapy and man repeller. So she has the best aesthetic and design and she's the coolest person I know. And she, whenever I like have coffee with her, I'm just like, God, where did you get that sweater? And it's always <laughs> a fun, it's always a fun story wherever she got her pieces of clothing for sure. So I think today we're excited about um, jumping into hot seat, which we normally do at the end, but Catherine and I were thinking it'd be fun to do it at the beginning with Nora because she's Great. super fast at banter and always smart and thoughtful. So oh, Catherine, no. take Away. Yes. I'm going to do a little bit of hot seat. The other thing I will say is that, um, Nora Taylor, you were in a universal standard jumpsuit, uh, in like a, a thing. I, I, I saw it and 10 minutes later, I bought it because you wow. look so good in it. So I, she's wearing it right wear, now. I'm Are not, right now? I'm, I'm not, oh, <laughs> I'm not, I was going to, but I have I didn't have time today to get it on. It's like a whole process. <laughs> But once you're in it, it is like buttery smooth. You're gonna, yes, you're amazing. gonna love it. I'm so <laughs> this is not, this Joycast is not sponsored by Universal Standard, just an no. FYI. <laughs> but if they ever want to sponsor you guys, great. They should do yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. We're here <laughs> and we love you. Oh, um, all right, hot seat, hot seat. We're gonna ask you some very quick rapid fire questions. You can respond with the first thing that comes to your mind. Have some fun. All right, first question. Mm -hmm. What is the thing you wake up in the morning looking forward to? Easy cup of coffee. Oh yeah, what do you put in your coffee? Oat milk. Brand. 
Oatly. And I've recently switched to drinking half calf because then I can drink more coffee longer without fully shaking. Um, so I love totally. it. Strongly love it. recommend. Totally. Yes. Okay. Can you describe your perfect day? Wow. Okay. I would sleep until at least 10 a.m. Then that coffee would be brought to me. <laughs> I would be wearing a cashmere robe until at least 1 p.m. The sun would be beaming in through my windows. I would get dressed. I would go and meet someone for lunch, maybe hang out in the park, come home, take a long, luxurious shower, put on a, maybe a different outfit, put on the same outfit, go to a museum or some sort of activity, have a really luxurious dinner, um, depending on what time it is, go to some sort of show. And then miraculously, I want to be back in bed at 10 p.m. <laughs> 12 oh, hours dang. of perfection. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So I, I think also a 10 p.m. bedtime is so oh, so yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, what are three things you're feeling joyful about right this second? Ooh, um, the color purple. I'm wearing head to toe purple. Ooh. I always wanted to do that, like, because there are those old ladies who are like, when I'm an old lady, and I'm like, I feel weathered <laughs> and I'm aged and I need a full <laughs> purple outfit. Um, what am I joyful about right now? I'm very happy that um, vaccines have been opened up to uh, almost everybody in New York City. Um, uh, it felt sort of weird, the sort of like who's fact, who's not weird balance dance that we were all doing. And I'm glad that people and everyone in the surrounding areas will now have access to it. Um, third thing that's bringing me joy. Um, you know what? Still coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, who is one person you really admire? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I shouldn't have to take this. I'm like cycling through people that I really admire. Um, I know it's corny, but I'm gonna pick my mom. We she just turned <laughs> she just Nancy! turned seven. Nancy, <laughs> she just turned 70 the other day. And like the exuberance and youthfulness and like joy and care that she brings to her life and like building the life that she exactly wants to leave uh, lead, I'm ex inspired by every day. So yeah. My mom. Yes, mom. Name one person that you secretly admire. Um, I don't know if it's that secretly admire. Wendy Williams. I don't. That's not a secret. Yeah. I I love her out loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> who do I secretly admire? Probably somebody. Somebody kind of gross. Yeah. Um, mine's Kim Kardashian. Ooh, that's yeah. a good, that's a good choice. Um, you always say that, but I feel like we don't need to hide that we like the Kardashians. <laughs> I didn't, whoa, I didn't say like the Kardashians. Just Kim. <laughs> um, ooh, yeah, it would have to be somebody who has a like really remarkable hustle that I don't necessarily align with values wise. Mm. Maybe Paris Hilton. I feel like we're, <laughs> yeah. we're cycling back around to sort of being like, actually, maybe yeah. Paris was one of the first brand, like individual brand people. Yes. Um, and she seems to have a sense of humor about herself. So let's go with Paris in the Amazing. same thing. Love have it. you seen that Love she's it. now like um, virtual reality DJing all over the world? I that's like it. that's her new hustle because yeah. she's a DJ and she's like I should be able to DJ anywhere at any time. Yeah, so. that's hot. I'm, that's hot. <laughs> that's right. Um, all right. What is one place in your life that you feel free? It can be an actual place or a figurative place. Um, I guess because she's been my pod. My friend Naima's apartment is a very judgment-free zone, mm. and we mm. just do dumb shit, and I can dance like an idiot, and yeah. Love but like it. a close friend's yes. apartment is always some place that feels very free. Where is one place in your life that you feel a little stuck, either actual or figurative? Oh man, always on the train. That's like what I don't. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's what so I don't real. look forward to. Like any time. Um, I've been pretty open about this. I have like a, an anxiety disorder, and being on the train was sort of what made me realize that like that was something that I needed to address. Um, so the train has always been a uh, hot button. <laughs> Yep. spot for me have you been back since you've been back yeah yeah and it is I think part of what takes some of it off of it is that I'm rarely going any place where I need to be which like in mm -hmm. earlier life was it was like the 
feeling um, claustrophobic, feeling out of control combined with like, I have to get somewhere and I can't do anything mm -hmm. about it. But now that it's usually been pretty leisurely um, and not crowded, it's been okay. Yeah, that's real. That's such a huge Also, difference. I'm medicated. Yeah. <laughs> We, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Strong support. Game changer. Uh, game changer. Um, what is your favorite sound? Ooh, I love, again, this is kind of cheesy, but a lot of my friends have had kids and I just love their like blabbing mm. little like four month old, like mouth, like mouth noisy kids when they're not saying anything. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I feel like I feel like children and old people always say really funny things in front of you and you're always able to like write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. Like yeah. We'll just accept that. That's a truth. <laughs> yeah. Um all right. And was, what is one thing in your house that you love and can you show us? Oh, yes, I can. Um so I have this chair that I bought for $3 in Appleton, Wisconsin when I was an undergrad. And it's pink and so perfectly pink. sized and like has seen better days, but it's comfortable. It's been with me in many apartments. The only apartment it wasn't with me was when I lived in Seattle and Alana babysit, babysat this chair for two years. Um, yeah. And so I don't know. I just think it is, it's become kind of a cornerstone of every place that I live. And I think for a decade I've been like, oh, maybe I'll get it reupholstered. And I haven't. And I just, um, it's perfect the way it is. Yeah. yeah I also it's, feel like oh go ahead I it's just so soft like I remember sitting in it and just being like oh comfort the size mm -hmm. you're totally right it's like the perfect lumber support like it's a great chair mm -hmm. yeah I also feel like reupholster like I, I've only known people to say I think I'll get my thing reupholstered who does <laughs> who actually gets things reupholstered real yeah, I don't know. I don't know who those people are, but yeah, if you're out there, yeah. let us know. Good on you. There's yeah. this reupholsterer <laughs> I follow named Nicole Crowder who does incredibly beautiful work. And I'm like, that is one day I'll be mm -hmm. one of those people who is like, Nicole, turn my, not this chair. Cause it's not quote unquote worth it. But yeah, that is probably my like peak. The Nancy Myers kitchen has been more realistically replaced with me, like buying a thrift store couch and sending it to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Like I now have a, a, a greater sense of my, <laughs> what level I'm working at. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I love it. All right, Alana, let's, that, that was your hot seat. You made it. You're amazing. Woo! Get it. Hot <laughs> seat. So, sweating. Maybe, maybe we'll give you another hot seat question at the end. So always stay on your toes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your time at Clever or like your working experience with the people that you're, that you're with. So Clever, the, at least as a follower, I've noticed you highlight a lot of homes. So I'm curious, like when you are working as the editor, when you are coming up with curating the page and whatnot, what do you look for in a joyful home? Or like, what do you think brings joy to a space? This is such a good question. Um, Cause one of the things about Clever is that it is part of AD, but we're very different. Um, and while I say, our, I think our standards are like just as exacting, we're looking for different things in the home. So a lot of times we will see a space that belongs to someone incredibly creative and interesting and it's like, this isn't a, you didn't work with an interior designer. It isn't like perfectly put together, but something about it seems like such a genuine reflection of who you are. We are very into this space. And then a lot of other times there are just some things that are like really beautiful and beautifully done, really uniquely done. Um, we like, we tend to, while we, while we highlight some very nice, very expensive places, a lot of them are smaller in footprint. So we look for mm -hmm. things like really smart choices, particularly in renovation and kitchens, things that are doing double duty. Um, yeah, it's, I, everyone I work with, I think is so tired of me because I talk about the soul of the site a lot. And I talk about that, like in regards to maybe some of our more like social justice community leaning posts, but also mm -hmm. like the soul of these spaces that we're looking mm -hmm. at. Um, so that is something that I think we, we look for when we're looking at all the beautiful spaces we get to see. What's, what's something on a personal level when you walk into a space that you like, if you close your eyes and think of like a space that really captivated you, what are aspects of the location that, that really like you jive with? Um, I, I. I love, I love a spot with natural light. I sort of like how wouldn't people work with the light that they have? Like if you have natural light and it is someplace that like floods in, I think if you have kind of an open and 
airy, but that doesn't mean like minimalist and white and crisp. Like it can be a lot of other things. Um, I like that. And then I've been in places that are kind of like dark and cave-like. And I like that too. Like really understanding your space and making the most of it. Mm -hmm. I love it. And art. I'm always looking at people's art. Yes. That's a, that's the most important thing of like, what, uh, what, what personality have you decided to mm-hmm. share? Mm-hmm. And also if you don't want to share any, that's like a very, that's a design choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then also, cause I'm nosy uh, refrigerators, like what people have in their refrigerators. Abs- that's what, what I know most about. Like, <laughs> you, you know, know like, no, on there, like postcards and oh. <laughs> No, I'm not going into people's refrigerators. I mean, some people's refrigerators. <laughs> By time, by the third time I'm at your house, I will probably go into your refrigerator and help myself. Like that's just where I'm at. Um, but no, I think that's one thing I miss about like house parties is just sort of being like, oh, here's this person I only quasi know. And look, their friend James is getting married. Like there's just kind of like yeah. these little snippets that are fascinating. Yes. Yeah. True. And I mean, I, I think also like what we choose to to see every day and put in back mm. into our brains every day. Like um, mm-hmm. all the weird notes that we have, the reminders that we have, like says so much about who we are. Yeah, for do sure. You, do you have any of those things in your house that like you, if you were like a, a stranger coming into your own house, do you think there's any one thing that they'd be like, oh, that's really fascinating? Hmm. I have a, a year round tiny black Santa. Um, it was just a piece of decor and not holiday decor. Cause he's very cute and I love him. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any one, one thing. Um, I'm looking around right now, trying to, I have a lot of subtle cat art. I mean, <laughs> what, what is a subtle cat? Um, it's, I have these postcards from the cat museum in Amsterdam and mm. it's like, a free it looks like a kind of like modernist sketch and then you're like oh there are little cats in there like it's just <laughs> <laughs> um that I think is a good uh that's indicative of my personality I guess yeah that might be that may be the thing that I can think of right now I love it have you learned a lot like um has what the how you I love how you're talking about the soul of a space mm-hmm. through the pandemic has the mm. has that changed like what have you learned about space through working e- editing and writing about space during a time where we're all sequestered yeah um I think that we all I think in many ways, the luxury of our homes has been sort of boiled down Mm -hmm. where you could afford to have like a, you know, a special crafting table or whatever. And like, that was your space where you went. And now that is a desk and that is where you work. Um, And I think that there has been something really interesting about the resilience of all of us, um, if we're lucky enough to work from home, sort of shifting our spaces and how we share and how you do that dance. And then I think that there is like, there is, you know, those were kind of like those special unique places that you maybe had to sacrifice for function. I think that it is fair to like miss those and mourn those. Um, Yeah, I think that function like talking about functionality was of course something that we did a lot last year. And now we are thinking a lot about what will stay, what will go, how, I know in my life that like, the sense of impermanence that comes with like not being able to think about the future in the same way. I think that'll absolutely affect the way that we shop for our homes. You're making, homes are big, like physically big, monetarily big purchases. And if the way that you think about investing in something and staying somewhere and what could happen is shifted, I think it'll be very interesting to see how that translates into something as seemingly mundane as how you approach buying a couch. Mm. Um, I don't I kind of got off topic from your question, but no, yeah. no, no, it's that's, I feel like that's, that's totally it, right? Like uh, the way that our investment in the soul of the space is really different. Our investment in space and every item in space is really different mm-hmm. now. And I feel like, I, I feel like I'm sure you're just seeing people, um, uh, taking on and changing and altering spaces in really different Mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. 
where it's like, I may have want so badly to buy a purely decorative like vase right now, but if I'm mm-hmm. budgeting, I'm like, actually, I need to put my money towards a better office chair. Like yeah. there's that kind of stuff that I think a lot of us have had to do. Um, but at the same time, you now have maybe squirreled away money from not going out where like you buy better bed sheets. So I think mm-hmm. the sort of like checks and balances math of where we spend money in the house has been really interesting this year. Mm-hmm. I was your did you already have your desk set up there before the pandemic no I moved it yeah Yeah. we have this weird little half office that Mm -hmm. um, doesn't really get light and is attached to the second bedroom so it was never a great workspace but um as soon as it became clear that I was going to be here forever (laughs) not forever that's dramatic but like this was now my office moved the space out here because a it's more private and b just again having the natural light has been really helpful um Yeah. yeah And looking out the window for sure. And just like, looking who's up. walking by? Life? Is yeah. there life? <laughs> so I am all up in my neighbor's business in <laughs> a new and spectacular way. And the cats hang out on the radiators. So I spend way too much time talking mm. to them. Like, <laughs> do, you, do you miss um, not in your home office space? Do you miss going to an office? Or are you mm. really into space at home now? Spending Ooh. that time there. I'm, I feel very lucky and that I really like the company of a lot of my coworkers. Um, and so I miss, I miss both like brainstorming meetings are different because you're yeah. sometimes bouncing off of other people's energy. Like you're kind of getting through the agenda a bit faster. Um, and then also that like, I don't know, there's that like quick relief of the pressure valve where like if you're stressed out and you go in the kitchen and you're just like, ah, and your coworkers, like it's going to be okay. Like I do sort mm-hmm. of miss that. Um, there's this really great article in Wired uh, maybe a month ago about the sort of unspoken geography of an office. And I was like, oh, that's what I miss is it's like Mm. the dark side of it was like, that's the crying bathroom. (laughs) Like that's sort of the routine in those pads that you have of like, this is, I stop and like, this person will be the person who will go upstairs and buy coffee. And like, this is my like partner who I eat lunch with. Like Mm. I sort of miss that routine that involves other people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I definitely, I mean, I was living, I'm living with my parents and am out of my childhood bedroom. And so getting a space was so important to me because I was mm-hmm. like, I need to have ownership over something. And it's so, it's so incredible, this like unique um, space that I have and just being able to like make it mine and walk into it every day and just be like oh I'm so grateful that I can do that because I know mm-hmm. that a lot of people you know you go from your bed to your desk and they're sometimes in the in the same room and that's really yeah. difficult yeah. yeah and that's why your routine is so important like I think mm-hmm. you know I don't have a very strict one but I have a do I do have a few things that are just sort of like all right work brain like yeah um yeah and what so, are they, what how do you turn it on and off I'm cu- very curious about that <laughs> I mean my number one way to signal to my brain that it's time to work is I put on a bra like that Real. is how, Real. Me too. That I is to. <laughs> I'm like business is getting done it doesn't have to be that supported like it's just the act yeah. of being like <laughs> yep no I feel um, you dude yeah that's I the love it. <laughs> yeah Je- it's jeans and a bra for me I'm like okay yeah. je- out of PJ pants jeans time <laughs> oh see no, mine is brushing my teeth like if I because br- and maybe that reveals something about the time the amount of brushing my teeth in the morning I do but <laughs> <laughs> there's I can wear whatever I want but as soon as I get that as soon as I get that flosser out it's like ah it's beginning business time <laughs> I my grandfather when he was retired was like you really only need to brush your teeth once a once a day and we're all like ew pa gross and then since working from home I'm like the man made a point yeah <laughs> he's got a point and like the dentist is the last place we all want to go right now during the pandemic yeah so totally it's like- it's gonna I be a while. And, I went in sort of early pandemic because I don't know why I'm sharing this on the internet. My bottom <laughs> teeth started turn, changing color. Yeah. Like, and I was flossing and I was like, oh my God, like, is there just rot like coming mm-hmm. up from the bottom oh of my teeth? And I went in, and the woman's like, you drink a lot of green smoothies? And I was like, ah, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can't believe I risked COVID because I've just been drinking too much spinach. <laughs> Wow. That is first world problems. Truly. 
<laughs> um, I when we're off, I'll tell you a really funny dentist and and COVID story <laughs> that involved my dog eating a a, um, a filling that came out, not of mine, but okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> of the only other person who lives in your house. Okay. Got it. Um, so wait, I'm curious about when we were talking about brainstorming and just like having sessions with the people that you work with doing that in a remote setting, you're actually one of the first people we've talked to on a joy cast who like works with a team. So mm -hmm. what do you all, how do you, how do you navigate that in your work of like talking to numerous people? Like if you're not able to have innovation set sessions, like how does that work? It seems kind of counterintuitive, but we do have to set aside particular brainstorm time because like our pitch meetings have gotten kind of rote because like no one wants to be on Zoom anymore. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's like, here's the agenda, here are all the pitches, we go through it, like done. And so when it's yeah. actually like, let's have some fun, let's have some conversations, like it helps to set aside a time to like do that, especially mm -hmm. I think to sort of be like, it helps in real life too, where it's like, this is not a, every idea you need to, every idea you bring has to be perfect situation. Mm -hmm. Like you sort of take that, um, like parameter setting that you would normally do in a regular brainstorming message uh, meeting. And you really have to apply it to like, this is actually a different kind of zoom. And yeah. I, I found that to be helpful. I think sort of, um, I think in the last couple of ones, like I am just thinking of this, but I think it actually helps to cut down on that like awkward Zoom banter where you're like, mm -hmm. hey, last meeting, huh? And it's just sort of like, <laughs> it helps to kind of dive right into that, I think. Um, yeah. But it is, it is tough, especially if you have different types of personalities. I think that's one of the things that can be harder is that like the people who are gregarious in real life are going to speak more and that can mm -hmm. really happen on zoom um so i think sort of in facilitation being intentional being like without calling people out being like you have a thought but to just sort of like yeah. keep space open at the end of sort of some someone's thought to um have response mm. um do you I, I was i'm so curious about we've talked you know the process of editing is really interesting in any writing any art form across all disciplines how do you choose what to keep how do you choose what to let go of and I'm curious if you have like a, a set of principles or ethics that you bring to your Ooh. editing process you know <clears throat> it's so that's an interesting question but because at the end of the day we are kind of service journalism in a way like mm -hmm people are there in house tours it's a little different but there always has to be some sort of takeaway like you otherwise we would just put photos on the website like there has to be something in the words that will make you want to stay and read them um so it is sort of both like the what's the story here like particularly if someone's like here's this thing that I've noticed and I'm not sure what the story is like what the story is um kind of has to be twofold of like I love people for storytelling. So I'm very game to be like, this is just an interesting person, but like what we, like if we're just profiling a ceramicist who makes cool stuff, like that's great. The service could be that you get to like, you're exposed to the ceramicist, but it helps if there's something else um, that's va quote unquote valuable mm -hmm. in that. Um, so I think sort of balancing those two things of like, we really don't want it to be dry. Like there are ways where, you know, and you know, the, there are times when that's appropriate. Like you don't want me making jokes when you're just here to learn how to paint a room. Like you're here for instructions. Um, <laughs> so I think just being, I think just being very aware of like what we're doing, why we're doing it, and like what a story is. Like everyone has to be on board with something either being more storytellingy or more servicey or like that. I think is perhaps the most helpful of kind of knowing what we're going for. Um, yeah. yeah. Which I think you also describe the ethics of every good piece of art is like mm -hmm. of, of, of identifying what are we doing, why are we doing it, and mm -hmm. what are the things that we have to balance for our audience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and sometimes the answer is why we're doing it is like, this is just really weird and we love it. Yes. Yeah. But there is some takeaway in it. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I also wanted 
wanted to talk about in our Joycast today that, so we met in theater, like we met in not-for-profit theater at Steppenwolf Theater Company in Chicago, Illinois. And um, yeah, Yeah. one of the biggest words, hot words of 2020 is pivot. And so, you know, I'm just really curious, like for you to have come from a theater background and a theater marketing background and then pivoting into the design world, like, do you have advice for people that are doing that right now with their careers during COVID? Mm -hmm. Or like, I'd love to hear any reflection you have on that time in your life and what, what drew you to this other career or profession? Yeah, um, I think in anything, connecting the dots is important. And I think especially um, now, a lot of places are moving away from like, just upload your resume and no fun questions or something. And I think I thought about why I wanted to change careers and like what I was hoping to get out of it and what it is about what I was currently doing that made me believe I would be good at what I was hoping to do um, and getting, getting good at like explaining that to other people. Um, especially since like, you know, I didn't have a blog. It wasn't like I had a secret, you know, writing blog to show people. Like Mm -hmm. I had to, um, I had to sort of figure out what it is that I thought made me valuable. And I, to be fully transparent, like luck played a huge part in, Mm -hmm. I think the speed in which I was able to transfer careers. And also the fact that I did it later in life. I think if you are someone who's Mm -hmm. later in life and you're changing careers, quote unquote, later in life. But I think so much of your first five to even 10 years of working is just learning how to work and learning how to be in an office and learning how to self-motivate. And, you know, I think there's a certain point where everyone gets disillusioned in a way where it's like, oh, all jobs are jobs. And learning, like figuring out if like, okay, is it just the fact that I've learned that like not every, like every job has those days, weeks, months where you're like, fine. Um, And sort of like continuing on with that or you're like, oh, is it actually where I am? Is it the field that like, what is sort of frustrating about that? Um, Cause I absolutely think some of the things that have been hard about media in general that have been hard about design that if I did everything that I've been doing but I moved it back five years so I was 20 24 25 like it would I think I would have burnt out my boundaries are like stricter like uh harder now um so I think like if you are pivoting careers don't discount the fact that you have been in you've been working for so long like if you're smart you're smart I'm assuming everyone's smart in their own way but like you're smart and you know how to work and like once you can figure out what those connections are that will make you that make you good at what you're trying to do I think there's that and then there's I mean yeah for me luck played a a part of it but I think that that is being ready if you do luck out being ready to show up and do the work when you get there is crucial Mm -hmm. I love that. Catherine, <laughs> yeah. Catherine and I today this morning with a similar conversation, I would say. Yeah. I also think, you know, I think there's something you're talking to about um, like learning how to trust yourself. And that's yeah. like so much of what all of uh, any career is of just mm-hmm. like, oh, do I know how to listen to myself when something works or doesn't work versus waiting for someone to tell me what to do. Yes, exactly. Betting on yourself is the number one thing you can do. I was just reflecting with a friend of mine who I also met at Steppenwolf and we were doing very different things and have had like a very, I think sort of both of us have had a watershed couple of years. And a lot of that was being like, all right, I'm just going to put myself out there. Mm. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and putting yourself out there in a time that's tough hard. like that it's really hard I mean I, I think also where you know you work in the digital space it, it's a very saturated world everyone's like hello mm-hmm. but I think what you know you so gorgeously spoke to was like but there are are you paying attention to why you're doing it versus just making stuff on the mm-hmm. internet yeah and you know I am not super active like I'm a lurker on Instagram, but like, I'm not an influencer type. I don't post that much. I'm not that active on Twitter. So 
all I have to sort of show for myself is my work. And I think Mm -hmm. that it can feel like nowadays that is not enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And it might take you, you know, you may not be at the top of the list when people are just trying to like make a grab for things, but um, you know, I find found some of the writers that I like who maybe don't have like huge social followings just from like being like, what website do I like? What stories do I like? Mm -hmm. Okay. I clicked on this. I found this writer. Like there are people out there who are still paying attention to the work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to write that on, I want to have that as a weird note around my house, <laughs> so, like someone to find, uh, for clever. If you ever come to my home, not that you would, but <laughs> oh, okay. One day. Yeah. One day. <laughs> Put it on your fridge. I'll find it. Put it in your fridge and I'll find it the third time I'm over there. <laughs> when I'm feeding you oat milk, all the yeah. oat milk from my <laughs> Oh, amazing. Um, we, we have, uh, what, uh, Alana, do you want to ask I, anything else? Are you good? No, no. I was curious. Did we have any comments or anybody asking any questions on the FB? No, we didn't have any questions. We had a bunch of folks watching us and your mom said, hi, and we love oh. moms. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, can you tell us, um, one thing, like when you close your eyes and you think about the feeling of being a feeling joy what is the first image that comes mm-hmm. to your mind Ooh. um I feel like there are two versions of joy which is like an exuberant joy which I think of as dancing in a group of people that I love mm-hmm. and then I've been for years I've been thinking about grace in my life and how it shows up like both like a grace type way and like grace um, and so like a, like a joyful grace or a graceful joy is, I think, uh, a moment of chosen stillness where you have like placed yourself somewhere and then everything else seems to sort of settle around you. Like when I'm trying to calm down, I think about moments where I've been outside, like even just on my stoop or like in, like in full on nature. And it's just sort of felt like I've stopped and like everything is sort of like in communion with me in that moment. So um, those are the two. And right now, because of the world, I miss exuberant joy so much. Yeah, totally, those experiences. Do you have any summer plans or uh, places you're gonna go travel that you're looking forward to this summer? Yes, back to my mom. Um, Yeah! For her birthday, we are doing a belated uh, road trip to the Grand Canyon, as everybody's (laughs) vaxxed. Um, and I've never been to that part of the country before. So yeah. I think like what better way to counteract sort of being, you know, I've gone places on the Eastern seaboard for like a weekend, but like what better way to counteract feeling sort of like, ah, than to just <laughs> feel in a yeah. huge expanse. <laughs> yeah. One of my, one of my best friends is there right now with her mom and she's been sending group text messages. And I, my goal for 2020 was to go to the Grand Canyon. Obviously it didn't happen, but I just can't wait to see the world, like to see mass, like vast, like God's creation in front yeah. of me. I'm just so excited about that one yeah. day. Humble me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am small. I yes. am small. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Totally. When, when I went to the Grand Canyon, it snowed. And so it was like, oh. God from above, like God below, like, <laughs> ah, like crazy, wild, wonderful, all of the forces of nature. Um, that sounds so Thank wonderful. You. Thanks cool. for hanging out with us, Nora. Yeah. This oh my gosh, so this was wonderful. So yeah. I, it feels like um, you have offered us so many both practical and soul centered pieces of wisdom. And that's yeah. like, what I feel like where we are as a, as a, as a society right now, it's like, okay, so like, I need some like steps, like one, two, three, <laughs> and also like feed my soul. Can we get both in this article about painting my house? Thank yeah. you. And we, <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. All right, girl. Well, enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thanks everybody for tuning in for you YouTubers. Thanks for stopping by. So love you, Nora, and we're signing off. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.